Good morning, brethren. This morning's scripture reading will be taken from uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested, those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Please bear with me. I'm a little bit blocked up this morning and I uh, couldn't figure out why it was, but then I remembered I was in Saskatchewan. <laughs> and that's probably why I'm, I'm feeling this way. Uh, I must just say <clears throat> we had a really good time in, in Weyburn, and I'll, I'll chat about that a little later on when I give my uh, ministry minute. But um, uh, the water down in Weyburn is absolutely terrible. I have no idea what they put in the water down there, but it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But uh, we had a, a really good time with, with all the saints there, and I met so many different people, and they uh, send their, their regards to to many of you that they do know. Um, Tim Pippis to uh, Skip and Mary Ann, uh, Stanley Bell to you, uh, Charles, um, the Popes to the Ferrises. Um, and then I also didn't realize how many Petersons there are down in, in, in the Weyburn area. There, there are stacks of them. And, uh, but many of them know many of you down here and, and they all send their, their love and, and regards to you. We're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 this morning. And uh, our series over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at these different churches. And our goal through this series is to to present lessons in such a way that it, that it has a, uh, a practical meaning to us. So we're going to look at these, these texts and we're going to try and see what God needs us to, to do in order to be better people for Him. And some of the warnings that He gives us, but also some of the, the, the things that He commends us on and that we need to continue to grow in. And so we're going to look at the first church this morning, Ephesus. <clears throat> and um, God's main complaint with them is that they've lost their first love. And we'll get into that in, in just a moment. But I want you to think back to just a second <clears throat> to when you first came to Christ. When, when someone spoke that word uh, of God to you and, and the excitement that you had with regard to this newfound truth in your life. And how you couldn't wait to, to, to be a part of that. How you couldn't wait to go through the waters of baptism. And how you felt when you came out of those waters of baptism. Right? Right? I'm sure that if, if, if I had to say this, that many of us would agree with this statement, is that we felt very much excited and though we could take on the world for Christ. Would I be right in saying that? Or did some of us just get wet? <laughs> I hope that when we came up, that we were so excited about it, that we just felt we could just take on the world and we wanted to share that with everyone else. And I think that is what God is speaking about this morning and we'll, we'll deal with that. But let me just give you a little bit of background in, into Ephesus. So Ephesus was a fr flourishing city. and had over 225,000 uh, population at, at the point that, that uh, John writes the letter to, to the churches. And uh, it was a, a real, real hub for, for industry, right? They had a huge harbor there where a lot of uh, trade would, would happen. It was just a flourishing city. But within the city, 
they had this temple of Diana or Artemis, depending on whether you were Greek or, or Roman. <coughs> it's, the, it's the same temple if you read through, through the text um, in, in Acts. But the first time we really see a, or, or look at this, um, this city is, is in Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, we see a whole lot of different things that Paul has to deal with and some of the challenges that they faced with in Ephesus because of everything going on. And as I looked at this, I thought, how different is Ephesus from our community today? When we think that they were a very self-made uh, community, they were very self-made uh, individuals, they worked hard, they accumulated wealth. How different is that to, to us today? If we look at Canada as a whole, and if I think of South Africa, right? It's no different. And isn't it obvious that in all of this, that there would be an aspect of neglecting God in many ways, because the focus becomes the material things, right? And society is dictating that in chapter 2, but also in our life today, is it not? That that's what it's about. It's about us making the next check. And one of the reasons that Anne and I left and, and moved to, to a city called East London from Johannesburg, uh, besides the fact that I had an opportunity to, to, to minister to a, to a congregation down uh, along the coast, was that I think for, for us we felt that, you know, you're just kind of chasing the next check, Right? every single month and that's what it became about that you were just working towards the next upgrade whether it was a car or a phone or a house and and, and you lose perspective in that when that's what we're pushing for and I think it's no different here that as they look at some of the things that that the church has to face here how easily those things would creep into the church and how God would now have to come through Christ and speak to his people and say, hold up, something's wrong. You're missing the mark. And I want you to note, if you go, go to Revelation 2, there's a couple of things that God says here. In, in verse 2, God commends them for incredible things that they're doing. The first thing he says is, I commend you for your toil, so your labor, your work, your ministry, right? He's saying, I commend you for these things. So they were individuals who were working very hard. The next thing he commends them for is he says that you persevere. So despite all these things that you're having to face and that you're having to deal with in the world, you are persevering, you are pushing forward. Still with me, guys? Right. And that's what he's saying. And then he goes on and he says um, in uh, verse uh, 6, but also in verse 2, he talks about how you cannot tolerate evil men. And then he says, you hate the, the work of the Nicolaitans, right? And what these guys were doing <clears throat> is that they were bringing in false doctrine. They were twisting the scriptures in such a way that uh, people's lives were justified in, the, in their sinful life. Does that make sense? So the way they were living their life, they taught in such a way that it justified those actions. And with all these temples going on, they would justify the aspect of sexual sin. They would justify the fact that, that, that you should chase material things. Does that make sense? So God's word was twisted in such a way that it made sense to them. And what it meant is that you would never need to change your life. Right? And isn't that exactly what happens today within our churches and even within our lives? That often when we are spoken to by God and, re and a scripture is revealed to us or a text is revealed to us, instead of looking at it for what it is, we try proof text that text to justify our lifestyle. And God is coming to his church and he's saying, I have a real issue with you right now. Because as much as what you're doing, all these great things, there's something that you lack. And I guess the best way for me to explain this is for us to go to Romans chapter 1 this morning and look at verse 15 and Paul writes to the church in in the book of Romans again encouraging them but also he's going to tackle some really tough things with regard to tradition and to the things that God's people are not doing and trying to encourage them to a point where they could be more like Jesus that is our goal in this life 
So Romans 1.15 says, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The word eager is the word thumos, and that means fire. So what God is saying here, what Paul is saying to the church, he's saying, I am on fire for God. And remember God's issue with the church here, as we see in verse 5, he says, Therefore, remember where you have fallen, repent, do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your stand out of its place unless you repent. Right? Because he has an issue with them, and the issue is in verse 5. Uh, sorry, verse 4, where he says, But I have this against you. You have left your first love, or you have forgotten your first love, depending on the version you have in front of you. And what Paul is saying here to the church, he's saying, I definitely have not forgotten my first love. Because I am passionate about Jesus, I am eager to speak to, him, to you about him, I have my first love intact. I want to ask you, remember I I asked you earlier, I said, how did you feel when you first came to Christ? That excitement, that fire, that willingness, that confidence to be able to guard and just want to share this new truth with others. Are we any different from the church here this morning? You see, I believe that if if we are not excited about Jesus this morning, then that will affect our testimony, our ministry to the world. If we are not constantly excited about being in Christ and being mindful of who He is in in our life, understanding what that salvation means to us, then we won't testify the way He needs us to. Think about that for just a second. And I hope that that speaks to us this morning in a huge way. The next two statements are very similar, maybe even saying the same thing, but I, I want to expand on them. <clears throat> our actions are often barometers of our heart's relationship. But Jesus says that as well, right? He says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And I want you to think about the things that you put effort into, the things that you are consumed with from day to day. And how much effort you put into that. And then I want you to take that and I want you to measure it up to how excited you are about being in Christ. How uh, fervent you are about studying His Word. How excited again you are about sharing Jesus with others. And see how that balances with one another. I was thinking to myself this week, when last have I just sat back and just being in awe of what Jesus has done for me. And when last have I been so excited about that, that it has motivated me to a point where I cannot contain that message anymore. And I had to think about that as much as what I go through the routine of day-to-day living, like how mindful am I of Christ being there and Him being that motivation for me to be better? On Wednesday nights we've been looking at the idea of what God expects of us and, and, and what my purpose is. And as we look at Colossians chapter 3, He really tells us exactly what our purpose is. And that is for you and I to be more like Jesus. That is what our goal on this earth is. Is to reflect Christ in every way. But how can I do that if I'm not excited about Him? How can I do that if I've lost my first love, which He is? Do you know the word agape is used 114 times in the New Testament? And we know that the word agape is associated with God always, right? I think God is trying to share something very important with us here. Now maybe your first love will mean something different to you this morning and that's okay. But I believe the root of this that, that, that John is speaking about is that this church has forgotten the reason that they're doing all these things. And isn't that what we can do from time to time? 
And we shouldn't be a church that just ticks the boxes, right? We need to be a church that is inspired and motivated by God's love for us. That's what 1 John 4.19 teaches us, right? We love because He first loved us. Is that my motivation? Jesus. Or have I forgotten about that? As much as what I'm doing, this superb job, have I forgotten the reason I'm doing these things? Right? I guess, basically, what it's saying is that the condition of our heart can often be identified by our conduct. Right? So, we said that there's a good gauge for us is to look at what we're doing, why we're doing it. And I guess we need to always assess that. But imagine if we could get to a point where we never have to assess that because Jesus is my focus. That everything I do stems from a point of Christ. Imagine if we could get there. And I'm not saying none of us are there. But I'm sure you can identify with what I'm saying this morning. Because often we do just go through the motions. And I wonder how God sees that. Because this church was doing so many good things. They were challenging individuals who were teaching false doctrine. They were really laboring for God in an incredible way and pushing forward, right? In the midst of a society that denied that God is God, right? And they persevered perhaps under persecution at times, right? Under ridicule. How many of us sitting here this morning have not been ridiculed because of who we are in Christ? Think about that. And when I say ridicule, it could mean different things. It could mean just people kind of shying away from us at times. Because they now know, oh wait, you're a follower of Jesus. And all their maybe warped ideas of what that means. It could mean rejection at time from the world. But I'm sure that each and every one of us sitting here this morning can identify with that in some way or the other. Ezekiel 33 verses 31 through 32 says this, They come and sit in front of you as my people and listen to the words you say, but they do not do them. With their mouth they speak of love, but their hearts are full of sinful desire. They think of you as nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays music well. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. Is that us this morning? Is that you this morning? Is that me this morning? I don't know. Only you can answer that question as only I can answer that question. But I do know this, that there have many, been many times in my life where this has very much applied to me. Because I have not wanted to submit to the very will of God. Right? And it's no use for us to go through the motions where we pitch up here on a Sunday morning and we give our worship to God, but that's where it ends. Right? It cannot be like that. There has to be more than this. This needs to purely be a time of worship, yes, but also a time of refueling for what we're about to do through the rest of this week. Does that make sense? That is what it needs to be. And God is calling us this morning to adhere to this and not be like these individuals who hear what God says, but they don't act on it. That's what James 1, 22 and 23 says, isn't it? It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And then it goes on to say, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, right? So you see it for a moment and then it's gone, right? That you're not looking intently and you forget about what you just saw. And that is why it's so important for us 
to not only be, I guess, listening to God's word, but to be going back and double checking it. Right? As much as what I know you think that I'm very perfect and I don't make mistakes, <laughs> right, Heather? I do make mistakes. And maybe I might quote a scripture that that's not that. Is it intentional? No. But I can make a mistake. But if you don't go and check that, and for the rest of your life you're going to say, Oh, isn't it John, isn't it John 1, 1, whatever it is, it says, in the beginning God created the world, right? And for the rest of your life you'll just look at because you're trusting this individual up here. And I'm thankful for that. But don't trust me. Okay. <laughs> go and check it up for yourself. Because that is how we grow. And I think this is the problem with these individuals. They're not spending enough time with Jesus, right? To really get who He is and to remember why they did it. Paul spent three years with this church at Ephesus, teaching and training them as we look at chapter 20, right? He says that. And what was he doing? He was encouraging them. He was strengthening them. And the fruit of his labor was revealed in what God says here, that I commend you for these things, but... And that three-letter word changes everything, doesn't it? Because all of that doesn't matter now because you say but. And God has such a big thing against it. He says, you have forgotten your, you have left your first love. He says, this I have against you. Irrespective of every, all the other good you're doing, you've missed out on who I am. And should I not be the center of your life and your ministry? And so as we look at this, I guess the most important thing we'll take home is this. How do we ensure that we don't lose our first love? So what are the things we can do in our walk with God to ensure that we stay fervent and we stay on fire for God day in and day out, irrespective of those challenges that come? Because I know, church, and I get that it's very hard always to, to have that positive mindset, to be on fire, to stay up top year when we're bombarded with the things of the world at time, right? And the cares of this world. But the first thing this morning, we need to be driven to be more like Jesus, right? So every single day of my life, when I get up, when God blesses me with another day, I must be asking myself this question. How can I be more like Jesus this day? Right? And again, we're only going to find the answers within the, the, the Word of God, right? And I mentioned to you Colossians chapter 3 is really an incredible text for us to see how to be more like Jesus. But be driven to be more like Jesus. How many of us are driven to be more like Jesus this morning? Is that my, pure, my, my purest and my only goal? And I thank you for those of you who put your hand up this morning saying, I want to be more like Him. But that's the first thing. The second thing this morning is don't ever be indifferent when it comes to ministry. Now what do I mean? What am I saying? Well, don't have this attitude. Oh, it really doesn't matter to me what we, what we do. Right? That's what it means to be indifferent. I'm neither for it, but I'm not against it. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter to me because I just, I'm just glad to be on a Sunday morning. I'm just glad to, to get together with my brethren. I'm just glad that we're doing something. And yet God, Jesus speaks to us in Revelation 2, and He says that's not how it should be. I'm glad and I'm thankful for you that you are doing so much. But what about me? Where do I fit into all of this? Am I the starting point of that ministry? And I, am I the starting point of your day? Am I the starting point of your study? Am I the starting point of your fellowship with one another? Make sense? Don't ever be indifferent when it comes to ministry. The third thing this morning, reject passivity in your life. Okay. Don't just go through the motions. Don't just sit back and not do anything. Maybe because you're afraid to act or 
you're wondering what people might think or how stupid you might look or whatever it might be, right? Reject it. We see God rejected that as He pursues a relationship with us. He needed to do nothing, right? When we think of right back in Genesis 3, where woman, I mean, man messed up, right? Man messed up, right? God could have sat back and said, well, I told you not to do this. You're on your own now. So what does he do? Immediately, he sets this plan for Jesus in place. And throughout the New Old Testament, into the New Testament, we see him pursuing and pursuing and pursuing a relationship with us by putting things in place in order to ensure that we can make the mark, even though we don't deserve that. Praise Him for that this morning. Amen? But He rejects passivity because He's not a God that's passive, but He's a God that is active. And He's asking us this morning as His church to be active in our ministry to one another. Right? And our ministry to Him. But if we just sit back and we just allow things to happen, we're no different from this church here this morning that he speaks of in, in Revelation 2. And notice what he says here. He says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember. Revaluate every single day, right? Because we do mess up and we do fall. And then he finishes off in verse 7. And he says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Remember we just spoke about what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve? And how they missed out on eternity really with God, right? Through their sin. And here God says, remember what, what I created back there? I'm going to restore it. If you will overcome. If you will overcome. If you will persevere. And if you remember that I am your first love. Are you on fire for God this morning? That's actually a question to you. Okay. Are you on fire for God? And it's a fire that cannot be quenched, right? Doesn't matter how much water is thrown on that fire, it still continues to burn. In fact, I guess for me the idea is that the more challenges that I'm faced with, the hotter that fire needs to burn. Right? And God is speaking to you this morning and calling you. He's commissioning us this morning. And saying, don't forget your first love. The reason that you do things is me. Always know that. Remember that. Right? As you go this week, I pray that God will strengthen you in a way that you can't even begin to imagine. But I also pray that you will step out in such a way that He can use you. And may that be motivated by your first love, which is Him and what He has and continues to do for you. Amen. Let's stand and sing.